So how do you form these interconnection networks? So typically there are two kinds of interconnection networks. Uh, one is static. So in static interconnection networks, what happens is that they are essentially formed by links. These links connect up different nodes together. For instance, here is a simple example. Let's say that you have a four node system. When I refer to a node, I mean a processor plus memory unit and its IO interface. So now I connect these up and I basically put a link between every pair of the nodes. Okay. This is one possible interconnection network that I've come up with. Everything is static over here, right? If X wants to send data to Y, then it essentially uses this link. This particular network is called a complete network. It seems like quite a good network. Why? Because anybody can communicate with anybody, right? Let's consider another network. So suppose you have another network where this is the way the four nodes are connected. So now if processor X wants to talk to processor Y, what does it need to do? It needs to first send the data to this processor, then it is forwarded here and then finally it's forwarded here. Right, so there are multiple hops that it has to traverse. So it takes time for it to do that. At each node, certain processing has to be done to forward the data. So in that sense, the complete network seems better. Why? Because anybody can talk to anybody. Right, so it won't take long. It's not going to suffer a lot of latency, right? If I want to communicate with another processor. So how do you measure the latency? So what characteristic of this graph will tell you the latency, how good or bad the network is with respect to communicating with somebody far away? Longest part, diameter. Okay, this is nothing but the diameter of the graph. So a complete network has a very small diameter, whereas a straight path has a long diameter. So what is the diameter here? It's three. What is the diameter here? It's one, right? But which one is more scalable? If I want to scale this up to thousand processors, So the first one will become a pain. If you want to build a complete network over 10,000 nodes, 100,000 nodes, it's a nightmare. You, you can't do it, right? It, it's not practical. Whereas in this network, a path, it's, it's easy to make it. But then it's not a great idea again, yeah, because just imagine the first node wanting to talk to the last node, it's going to take 100,000 steps for that message to hop away, right? So what are some of the more practical networks? One common network that has been used is the mesh, uh, 2D mesh. So what does the 2D mesh do? So this is a 2D mesh, okay, of how many nodes? 16 nodes. All right. So it's quite simple, looks like a matrix, right, four by four four rows, four columns, and every node is attached to its neighbor on the left, on the right, up and below, except for the boundary nodes. What is the diameter of this network? Let's talk in terms of n. If I had n nodes in a root n by root n configuration, which two nodes should I select to look at the diameter? Diagonally opposite, right? So this one and this one. So it takes me root n minus one hops to reach this bottom node and then how many hops? Root n minus 1. Another root n minus 1 hops to go from here to here. Right? So let's not bother about the minus 1. So it's uh, roughly about 2 root n. That's the number of hops I have to take. So a simple trick that uh, is used in practice to reduce the diameter. So, so this architecture is called a 2D torus. So what you do is you just add another wraparound link. So the last node gets connected to the first node, uh, both horizontally and vertically. Boundary, yeah, there's no boundary. Now all nodes are treated equal, right? What is the diameter of this graph? Two, no, 
you're supposed to look at the two nodes which will take the longest time to communicate with each other. The two nodes which took the longest time to communicate with each other in the case of 2D mesh are now very close to each other. But that doesn't mean that these are the furthest nodes. Now who's the furthest? I'll, I'll fix one of the nodes because no node is special, right? Because it's totally a symmetric network. So let me fix one of the nodes. Let me fix this node. Which is the node furthest from this node? 3 comma 3. Halfway down, halfway across. And what will be the diameter? Uh, in terms of n? Around root n. So you've suddenly halved the diameter just by adding the wraparound links. That's not a huge cost, right? Yeah, what is the number of links in a 2D mesh? So the number of horizontal links I have is root n minus 1 times root n. There are root n rows and each row has root n minus 1 links, right? And the number of vertical links I have is the same. So roughly this is about n, right? Roughly about n. This is also roughly about n. So I had a total of about 2n links. And in the 2D torus, what do I have? So if I just look at one row, how many links do I have in a row? Instead of root n minus 1, I have root n. So it's root n into root n and root n into root n, which is again about 2n, right? This is just a difference of 2 root n. Asymptotically, it's the same number of links, but I've got half the diameter, right? So these are some simple tricks that I use to build these networks. 2D torus is quite common in practice. In, in practical networks. So there are different parameters that are used to gauge how good a network is, right? One of them is the diameter, which basically tells you in some sense the latency, how long is it going to take for a request to be serviced if it's sent from one node to another node, right? Uh, assuming the furthest nodes, right? So diameter basically tells us the uh, latency. Another is the number of links, right? This in some sense determines the cost of the network, right? Cost and also maybe how practical it is. Number of links as well as the degree of a node. So what's the problem in a complete network, right? So if you have a complete network, this is a complete network of five nodes. So if you have, let's say, n nodes, a complete network of n nodes, what is the total number of links you would have? NC2. NC2. That's quite large, asymptotically n square. And the other problem is the degree. What is the degree of every node? n minus 1. Just imagine every node, if you have 100,000 nodes, every node has 100,000 links going out of it. You, you, can't, you can't even practically design such a system, right? So although, I mean, a complete network would be great in terms of designing algorithms, but you, you don't have that flexibility, right? We cannot make such networks. People have gone beyond 2D mesh, 2D torus to 3D mesh, 3D torus, right? That's quite common. Okay, so you can imagine what a 3D mesh and a 3D torus is going to look like, right? Same thing, make it a cube. N, by, n to the power 1 by 3 cross n to the power 1 by 3 cross n to the power 1 by 3. Right? That would be the configuration. And then you can put wraparound links also. Now wraparound links would be in three directions. Right? So each node would have six neighbors. Okay. So as you increase the dimension, right, it starts becoming more and more dense. There are benefits of that. Density means that the cost goes up because more links uh, practically starts becoming more and more challenging but the diameter reduces, latency reduces. Another important factor that we consider in a network is how much data can I pump through the network? So how do you exactly measure that? So there's something called bisection bandwidth. This is essentially the amount of data that you can pass through two halves of the system, right? I should say any two halves of the system. So the maximum amount of data that you can pass through any two halves of the system. So let's consider a network which is a straight path. 
what is the maximum amount of data I can pass through two halves of the system. So let me break it up into these two halves, four here, four here. How much data can I pass from any one half to the other half? Let us say that for the time being that the capacity of each link is one unit, right? So how many units can I pass at any given point of time from one half to the other half? One unit, two units? In this case, two units, there are two edges, right? One is this edge and the other is this edge, right? So I can pass two units. If, if I did not have the wraparound link, then it would be one unit, right? Okay, what about a 2D mesh? Or let me just take a 2D torus, right? So what is the cut that divides it into two equal halves? So let me just take a vertical cut. You can try out other kinds of cuts, okay? But you'll realize that uh, you know this is the most binding. So what do I want? I want to find out what is the maximum amount of data that I can pass through any two halves of the system, right? So I want to find that cut which gives the minimum number of links because that would be the most restrictive. Let's just consider this vertical cut. So what is the total amount of data I can pass through this? Two. 2 root n, okay? And in a complete network? So just consider a cut in the complete network, right? Every node on the left hand side is connected to every other node on the right hand side. So how many links going out of every node? n by 2? going to the other side, right? We are we are interested in how many of them are crossing the cut. So n by 2 and how many nodes on the left hand side? n by 2. So there are n by 2 nodes, each of them having n by 2 links going to the other side. So the total number of links is n square by 4. So as you can see, right, here you had two units, you improved it to 2 root n by going to a 2D mesh, 2D torus and then you improved it to order n square, right? by going to a complete network. So these are the major factors that determine how great a network is, right? How good a network is. The latency, which is the diameter, the number of links, which determines the cost, and the degree also, which determines how practical it is to build such a network and also the cost, and the bisection bandwidth, right? Which determines how much data you can actually push through the network as I said, right, there are two kinds of interconnection networks, static and dynamic. So what is a dynamic network? A dynamic network has links and switches. So what is a switch? So a switch is essentially a device which has some input ports and some output ports and it has the capability of redirecting data from any of the input ports to output ports. So a simple 2 cross 2 switch would look something like this. It will have two inputs, two outputs and then it would have logic inside of either sending them straight or switching them. That is the simplest kind of switch you can build. The point here is that this is dynamic in nature because the paths are not established up front. Let us draw a simple network which is switched, right? So you have four nodes and you have a switch sitting over here and all these nodes are connected to the switch and now when I send some data, let us say x wants to communicate to y, what will happen? It will send data to the switch and there has to be some header in that data that I am sending which tells the switch that I want to send this data to y, right? So the switch will read that address from here that this is meant for y, so I am supposed to send it to y and it will dynamically set up a path and forward this data, right? So we won't get a whole lot deeper into interconnection networks or distributed memory systems because we are going to focus more on shared memory systems than OpenMP, right? So we'll stick to shared memory systems.